Welcome back to another episode of Did I Stutter? Who Cares? It doesn't matter. I used to at one point. I used to. For a long time I did. And something about Ian's presence and his affinity for soccer, or sorry, football. Do you think soccer fans get upset when you call it soccer? Maybe in Europe. In Europe, right? Yeah, but here in America, nah. Yeah. yeah. Because the NFL games are also getting so big out there mm-hmm. and then so we're gonna have we're gonna have a a a, a collapse or i mean at some point because we've never at one point ever called american football anything other than football mm-hmm. and i know that so many games are now going over to germany uh england you know things like that which is really kind of cool to see a lot of european people just wearing jerseys to games that aren't for the teams that are playing which is fantastic mm-hmm. but I don't know. I, 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 that feels like a revolution that is imminent, which is f- football fans out there who are fans of f- both football and football mm-hmm. are going to have a tough time delineating. Which like, is what which. football are you talking about? Yeah, which football are you saying? Here? Yeah, yeah. What you what, what, like? What do you mean? And there's there can't be a world where people over in Europe are fans of American football, but not but not football, soccer football, because soccer football, like, that's like the OG. Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised. There's probably one person in Europe that doesn't like football, football, soccer football. Yeah. And that person's probably ostracized. (laughs) But as far as, like, the two words clashing, like, you know, there's words in England that have always meant different things. Yeah. You know, like, cigarettes here. Yeah. is fag there yeah. like when I was growing up. Is that still what happens over there? They I don't know. I haven't been there in a while. Yeah. But that it, I, I, I don't understand why that was the word. Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand. I mean, but I know that... But knickers is panties or right. underwear. Right. And so... I know that there's something that they say is um, they had me... They had me in... They had me in... Sti- what do they say? They say something like they had me... Not in stitches, but... Uh, they say something over there for like when 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 they're laughing so much mm-hmm. they it, or they're 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 having such a good time as far as comedy. There's something that they said. I remember when I was when I was performing out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, they that was this thing that they said a lot was they you had me. It's not in it's not in stitches. I'll I'll remember it. Yeah. But um, it it, it was it, like it, it's it's interesting. A lot of the terms that they have over there that um as a as an american when you say certain things you're not aware that they're funny or that they're different like um bikes are cycle like a bike is not a bike it's a cycle they all call them cycles yeah there's words yeah. we can definitely for the two countries that like specialize in english the most <laughs> We yeah. can definitely still misunderstand each other. <laughs> yeah. Like we've, yeah. We figured out a way to make English a different language. A different language than English. Yeah. <laughs> now I didn't know that you were. I didn't know that you were born over there. Yeah. That's like yeah. the craziest thing that I read. I looked it up online and. Oh, and, and Yeah, and it said that. Like, can you explain how that came to be and how you ended up over here? Uh so my parents are both Jamaican, mm-hmm. and then at some point they moved to England to like, you know, it was a time in Jamaica where you could go to England and get jobs and make money. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I know England ain't as tropical Mm -hmm. as uh, Jamaica is, but you could go there and make some money and send stuff back to Jamaica and make a good living. And so my parents did that. They they weren't together at the time. Mm -hmm. They re-met in England. Like they knew each other somewhat in jamaica and, and they weren't married in jamaica no oh no. i see i see okay i thought and, you were saying they were married in jamaica and then no, they, they separated and then they re-met in england <laughs> and rekindled know, that would be complicated <laughs> yeah <laughs> but they re-met there mm. and obviously hooked up yeah and had children there yeah and then at some point when i was nine they decided to move back to jamaica so then i was in jamaica for a minute till i was like 17 wow and then moved to New York when I was like 17. What prompted the move to New York? Was that by yourself? No, no, no. I went with my, my mom moved out ahead of us. Mm. 
and then brought us over, got a job, made yeah. some money, you know, could show the government that she was making a living. Yeah. And then we all went out Damn. after, you know. You, you were so well traveled even before you were 20. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I guess. I mean, I, I would like to say I'm exotic. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Grew up, grew up a lot of places, you know. So, What's you been know. your favorite place that you've lived so far? Do you re- and also do you remember your childhood like when you were in England? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I remember my childhood like yeah. it, it was it was just fun, you know. Yeah. Uh, had friends there, played soccer in the schoolyard. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, watched soccer on TV. I was like always into it then, and then uh, actually that that's the first thing I ever wanted to be was like a professional football player. You know what I mean? When, like as a kid. When, 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 like, when did you decide that that was not something that you were going to do, or something that? When I when I went to co- college. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you, when I went to college in America. Yeah. And I went to be a walk on, on the college soccer yeah. team. They had a bunch of English players mm-hmm. that had failed to make it professionally in England. And they, those failed players were way better than me. Yeah. And I was like, if these motherfuckers <laughs> fail, <laughs> my yeah. dream is done. Yeah. Like they yeah. were physically and technically like just bred. Yeah. From because they'd been in like youth systems of clubs. Mm-hmm. So they'd just been. And I was like, how did Simon and I, there was this one guy named Franklin. Like you could close your legs and he'd still put the ball through it and go around you and get it on the other side. So and I was upsetting. like, how? But they, they, you know. Maybe if I had stayed in England, I'd have had, like, the same training as them. Because, mm-hmm. you know, they would have joined, like, the youth teams of, like, professional clubs. Yeah. And, you know, and I think they those guys could still have made it there. It's just that at the time, what English teams were looking for were, like, physical players. Yeah. As opposed to, like, more technical players. Yeah. And I think what's, I think what's crazy about that is... When you're watching soccer, like so, uh, Americans' biggest gripe with with football or soccer mm-hmm. is that they don't think that a lot is happening or that enough is there's not enough action or there's not enough like goals being scored. And it's mm-hmm. like, I think when you watch the the like the Premier League and you watch, I mean, even soccer here, they're competing at such a high level that like someone who's the best striker going up against the best defender you really you're not even able to see the separation between someone's uh skill set because it's being matched by its counterpart you know what i'm saying like they're just they're they're both so good like someone like you still can see some that someone's amazing with the ball but if someone's just as good at defending you're not going to be able to see how good they are with their with their footwork you know plus america does things to their sports to like add excitement like the way it's like presented like i love american football and i love american basketball but there's so many stops and starts in the Mm -hmm. game but as there's stops and starts every stop has like three replays from different angles Mm -hmm. so like even when there's a timeout or people are in a huddle and nothing is happening Mm -hmm. like you're getting a feedback of something happening so it looks like football is continually moving but it ain't it's just replays you know what i mean and somebody talking and filling you in about what's going on like i forgot what the ratio is but for american football game of the amount of time that the game is on the air if you it's so little the Mm -hmm. actual time that is played yeah you know and same and then when you like have like a football game in america could end 21 14 right Mm -hmm. which is three two in soccer yeah yeah (laughs) but they added seven it's seven points for one score (laughs) so then when you look at the score you're like man that was an exciting game man they scored 21 points nah they scored three times man and then they multiplied it (laughs) that's what they did (laughs) so there's this illusion you know that's so clever that's Mm -hmm. so true though yeah yeah that's so crazy and and i think I mean, my I saw I told you this. I got into soccer because of my father in law. My my wife's dad is he's you know he's Bulgarian. So in Europe, like oh. that's just a big thing. Mm-hmm. And you know he 
you know, he grew up watching Berbatov and, you know, and, and, and so, you know, Tottenham is kind of my team just because of him, his time in Tottenham and mm-hmm. really getting to know Harry Kane and, and, and son, like those guys, they're just an, they're just an incredible, they're a magical mm-hmm. duo to watch together mm-hmm. as much as I know, like Tottenham isn't the best organization, but, mm-hmm. um, that was his big gripe whenever we would watch American football together. It was just, it, it, it just stopped. And, and, mm-hmm. and, and really only in appreciating what I learned about uh, uh, European b- football is, is like when I really appreciated it, I was like, wow, I can actually see from the other perspective of like all these stops and starts and these advertisements. And mm-hmm. then like, and then it, I mean, it, it, it is just kind of like stopping and then resetting and then going again where, you know, the... F- physicality that you have to have to the stamina that you have to have to be a soccer player to be a European football player I mean it's just it's it's insane it's 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 an I mean it's it's crazy to think that those guys go 80 minutes and then some of them get, some of them play the whole game right you know it's crazy yeah it's pretty physical like like one of the knocks like when I first moved here was like <laughs> I, like they used to use derogatory terms like it's a soft game mm-hmm. you know they used to like just put it down mm. and just you know what whatever you use to like say a game is not manly mm-hmm. they would say about soccer interesting but now people like are aware of how physical it is more yeah you know what i mean and i think maybe i'm wrong like about golfers this. be talking shit yeah and i was like bro you <laughs> <laughs> You're riding in a cart, bro, <laughs> to the next hole. How dare you? <laughs> That's so funny. I mean, do you think that we're in a time where soccer in America is starting to get more eyes on it, more viewership? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Like, every World Cup has pushed the sport. Mm-hmm. America's put more money yeah. into their team. Yeah. And uh, they want to win the ultimate prize. And in order to do that, you have to build it up. Yeah. through all the levels in the youth you got to sh- have an american league that you put on tv and you promote that and there's more ways to make money during the actual playing of the game through advertising on the electronic billboards that can change from one ad to the next sometimes at the top of the screen of a soccer game there'll be like like an ad up top that they keep changing from snickers to whatever to whatever mm. so they found that way to like because the game doesn't go to commercials, they had to figure out a way. How can we make money showing this thing? And I think that's what was a part of what was holding it back. Mm. Like the fact that there were no commercial breaks. Yeah. So it's like, how can we make money from the thing? But now with the electronic boards around the side of the pitch yeah. that keep changing to different ads and also at the top of the screen, you could keep changing it. Then, yeah. Then it's like, all right, we can we can broadcast this. Yeah. To make some loot. Yeah, of course. Because that's really... All the um, America's just built on how do we make money out of something like commercializing, this. yeah, yeah commercializing yeah. it. It 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 it's clear with I mean even with even with comedy that mm-hmm. that's something that if if someone can make money off of you if mm-hmm. they if they can if you can be packaged and marketed mm-hmm. there's there's money in that and then I mean America figured out very quickly you 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 double down on something that works and then you cut off something that doesn't yeah. Um, like, like, look at like, racing, like NASCAR, like all the ads on the car. Mm-hmm. You, you don't even know what type of car that is. <laughs> it is. It's, it's got so much. And if you look at like a lot of South American <laughs> soccer teams, they got so many logos on their jersey. They look like a NASCAR. <laughs> I was like, what team is that? You don't even see the team thing. It's like it's the, the person is wearing multiple billboards on their jersey. <laughs> yeah. you know? And even, you know, even European soccer, they, you know. Like, uh, you know, you have whatever the sponsor is on the shirt. That's a part of the shirt. Sharp yeah. used to be for United. And now they got like another ad on the shoulder. Yeah. So it's it's bananas. Like they you can put an ad anywhere. It's wild. Yeah. They can't. You can and they do. Mm-hmm. Um, so what after you, when you went to college, what was it that you like? What made you transition over to being like, OK, I want to do stand up. And then did you start stand up in New York? Yeah, I started stand up in New York, and it's just uh, I was like, never thought about doing comedy, ever. Like I enjoyed it, mm. and I always thought that comedy, is some shit, you just had to be born, like 
with the gift. You can't mm-hmm. fake it. Mm-hmm. I was like, man, you could probably fake being a good singer or fake, you know, like acting, like learn, but comedy is like, you have to be more natural. But also just coming from a different country and living in New York, I had to figure out a way to like make friends because I didn't have the context mm-hmm. of everything in America that everybody else had to like stay to join into conversations. Sure. So having a sense of practicing to try to have a sense of humor mm-hmm. was a way to do that. So then practicing to have a sense of humor just to make friends, like made me funny. Mm-hmm. And then somebody suggesting you should try comedy mm-hmm. just because I was just trying to communicate was like, all right, let me try it now. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, and it, cause as soon as somebody said it, it resonated with me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, the thing I never thought I would ever do, I just decided I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. Yeah. I mean, because you're thinking about, like, I, I think that there is some level of, I think there's some impact that moving or coming from one environment to another environment, like mm-hmm. Trevor Noah has built a whole career on that. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he's literally talking about things this way are here this way and mm-hmm. things over here are not that. Yeah. And that's not a knock on him at all. That's no. just that. It, it, I think there's so much feelings of inadequacy or feelings of like, I just want to, to, to try and fit in. And if the way you can do that is not through like, I don't know, some like, like I, I'm not like a, this incredible athlete, like, you know, I, you know, if you're not like a cookie cutter of like, mm-hmm. uh, that performance type you, but still somehow have that, that, that that perspective and that competitive nature to you i think um i think that like that that that's humor's like kind of an obvious sort of uh um outlet and so you can see it as almost a weakness where you come here and you're like i don't know any of these people or how they talk or Mm -hmm. or how they what the references are how things are ran but at the same time you're also given the perspective of you know living and being in different places that they hadn't Mm -hmm. like even if Like, when I moved here, soccer wasn't that big. Mm -hmm. You know, like, gay people would beat you up if they (laughs) found out you played soccer. That's where we were on the totem pole. (laughs) You know, like, I had to stay in the soccer closet and be like, I don't don't know nothing about that sport. I had to sneak and go play with some friends. You know what I mean? That's where soccer was when I moved here. So so soccer wasn't going to be the way to socialize. It helped me socialize on a certain level you know so i had to find something more universal yeah and and that was like making people laugh you know what i mean yeah now what is uh do you think that comedians are they're competitors right Mm -hmm. i would say so many so many comedians they have that same sort of uh that 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 wavelength that they work on that that uh their frequency is just like, how do I get better? How do I get this better? How do I get to be the best version of whatever this thing is? Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of parables between, I I, I heard so many comics who they grew up playing sports or like they, they either played sports and they weren't good at it. So then they figured out that they were um, gonna do comedy or um, people who were also successful as athletes transition over to comedy and they're able to do that, which I mean, fuck those people, but it's so upsetting. <laughs> the idea that, that, that they could do be great at both. At what acting and then at, com- at, at like at, uh, at, uh, sports and, and comedy, right, right, right. you know, like there's people who, you know, I know in my friend circle who they were like in the minors for like in the minors for like, a. uh, uh baseball and mm-hmm. then we're just like yeah i don't want to do that i want to do stand up which is crazy and then they're good at it yeah son of a bitch yeah i know <laughs> how dare they you, you know there's a basketball player like professional ex nba player i saw him the other day and i didn't recognize that it was him and then I, he was mad humble mm-hmm. you know and he's brand new at it so we we spoke a little bit and i was like this dude's mad tall and then after he went upstairs to the belly room and did his set, which I didn't see. Mm. And me and the other comics were talking about him the next day. And I said, that's Big Baby. I forgot what Big Baby's nickname is, but that he was a legit NBA player. Now he's starting to do stand-up. Really? And just from his disposition, 
I was like, in a few years, this motherfucker's gonna be funny, bro. <laughs> so you're gonna make money in the NBA and in comedy, asshole. Wow. I mean, Blake Griffin was going on stage for a while as well. He was a natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah he yeah. was too. I mean, I saw him at Just for Laughs, and it was like, what, what, what? Like, <laughs> this is crazy. This is like his second Just for Laughs. I just got in. Yeah, you know? he's already rich. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're fighting through a stutter, and this guy <laughs> is a specimen who's rich who could jump over cars. He's won the dunk contest. Yeah. <laughs> what is he doing here? Taking my yeah, job. It's yeah, it's crazy. I mean, uh, and then they have. Um, uh, what's the who's the who's the rapper that Ti Ti is doing oh, comedy T. right now comedy too? Now. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, he's gonna get good at it. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean it's like it's not it's not. It, it do, I mean, do whatever it is that you want to do, but I mean, <laughs> it it's crazy to think that these guys are they've they're just like they've conquered what they what you would consider to be conquered in mm-hmm. their field, right? And then you know come over come over to to comedy, and I think it's because there's just there's just this allure a- around it that's just so like mm-hmm. there's so much control over the art form from a singular standpoint which is i'm i'm in total control of however i want to do this mm-hmm. and it's like i think you just you 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 see some you, if you say something to someone one time where they thought it was funny or they thought it was a story you you almost flip that switch of just like maybe i can do this on stage maybe i can and then when you do eventually go on stage you you do that more often like we end up you know as as comics we end up going oh that could be something that could be something and it's just i think we get addicted to the idea that you can use a a, a thing on a, a you can use something under that other that new medium that new vehicle that you just create that you just created that really comes from like day to day conversation and activity you know yeah. there's something profound about ti doing stand up because you're a rapper you think as a rapper you get to say everything you want to say yeah i guess that's true right but then you're coming to comedy to say even more yeah or but in a funny way but in a funny way i mean rap has this this shroud of like hardness around it like Mm -hmm. this shroud of just like you 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 know you really have to like grind your way up and Mm -hmm. and and there's some sense of like uh like the every rapper is like came from like you know unfavorable circumstances or right. whatever and it's just it to to go on stage and make someone laugh it feels so different than rapping yeah i mean he's gonna have to like work at it a lot yeah you know but you know if he can i feel like if i was like he already knows how to write yeah in a form of writing yeah he just has to translate that to comedy he always has already has stage presence mm-hmm. so you know, you just, it's just going to still, there's a process. Yeah. And there's a time, it, it's time consuming and you have to commit to it. But as long as he does, it should be all right. Yeah. And I think there's also a humility component or not even, yeah, humi- yeah. you know, a humility, but just, uh, you have to just be human. And I think, I think what's hard about it from someone who comes from a place of like success before is like, mm-hmm. you, you still have to find a way that people can relate to your story or at least empathize with it, you yeah. know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what is your process for when you uh, end up writing something or, or you end up coming up with something? Like, what is it that you you found? Because you've been doing this, you've been doing this for 20 something years? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, Longer than that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's insane. It's, mm-hmm. in, it's, it's insane to, to be around it. So, like, for that long, what what's what's your process for like um how you start something and 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 knowing that it's got legs uh like everything is like a one-liner mm-hmm. and then so i was, used to do one-liners but then i was like man you know how many one-liners you're gonna need how many topics you're gonna need to get a one-hour set mm-hmm. so then it was like what else there's more meat on the bone of this topic. So just mm-hmm. explore the entire topic of this one liner. Yeah. And then you get a, a joke from this part, a joke from this part, two jokes from that part, three tags from the original part. And then you put it in an order that almost makes a bit or a story. Mm-hmm. And then when you've like, like exhausted all the meat on the bone, then that's it. But I also leave the bit open for 
improvement. I never say this bit is done. Mm. I, I don't have any more to add to it right now, but something could happen at any moment. Yeah. If I just leave it open and I can add another tag, if not a whole nother part to it. So yeah. I just basically do it like that. Do you write on stage at all? Or are you someone who prepares before and you're just like, that's what I'm going to work from. And that was a, that was another thing. Like people say, this is how I write. This is how I write. And say there's like four ways to write. I write all four ways. Yeah. And there could be more than four ways. To, I'll do it in the mirror. Mm -hmm. I'll sit down and write it out. Mm -hmm. I'll listen to the set and as I listen to the set on the way to the club or whatever, yeah. I'll hear something I didn't remember I said and make sure I incorporate that. Or I'll hear a space where I can throw a, a punchline mm -hmm. that I didn't think was there yeah. just by listening. I'll imagine the whole set. Like I used to live in a valley mm -hmm. and I didn't used to record my set, but on the way home, I'd go through the set in my head and I would see where i could add jokes yeah to what i did that night yeah and i also would imagine like what was my mood when i went on stage that night like like if the comic before you kills it kind of affects you sometime and if mm -hmm. they bomb it also determines how you're going to approach the audience mm -hmm. so i'd take all that into consideration yeah so that when i went through the set i'd have my emotions involved too mm. and also use that to help me like figure out what happened and how to improve it how calculated are how, i mean how connected to you are you to your um feelings and your moods like how privy are you to what you're feeling just before you go on stage because you're someone who to me mm -hmm. you seem so cerebral so calculated with mm -hmm. your you know you're a wordsmith you're someone who you you get rid of any fat on something and you're constantly playing with the words so I'm curious, how does the connection from the way you're feeling, like, how connected are you to that? And does that, like, does that feel like that's influencing anything uh, uh, as far as the words? Say that again? No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say, Drew? <laughs> I kind of get it, but I, I kind of don't like, get it. I just mean, like, like I, I'll, I'll give you an example yeah. for, my, for myself. I... Sometimes I don't even feel like I feel things. I feel like I experience them in my head, experience mm -hmm. the thoughts of, of what the jokes are, mm -hmm. but, but how much of what your performance, like how much of that that gets laid out is something that you're like, man, this is, this really is, uh, this really, like how much is it, is it, how much of it is dictated from your mood? I mean, Mood definitely plays, but good thing I'm normally even keel. Yeah. You know, just in life period. Yeah. You know, which is a thing I'm grateful for. I don't take for granted. So then, and then, listen, if you're a comic, and it, let me just say for me, but it might be for other people, like, you could be sick all day, but you have to do a spot. The moment you have to do that spot, that spot is the only time for that day when you don't feel that fever, you don't feel that stomach ache, mm -hmm. like you you disconnect from anything that's going on around you and connect to the job at hand. Mm -hmm. And another thing about comedy, which is kind of an aside, but has to do with what you're saying is, the more you do a joke, the more I disconnect with how I even came up with the joke and the emotion involved in it. Yeah. But then I just know what I'm saying Mm -hmm. But I don't remember always how I started saying this yeah. and why it works. Yeah, I just know it does and I just do it. So there's some roboticness mm -hmm. involved in it, in the performance. But then there are some jokes. There's this one joke that takes me out of being a robotic person on stage. Yeah. Because for some reason, I'm still involved with it emotionally. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a it's a joke about uh, having a friend who's a black albino who says yeah. the N-word a lot. Yeah. For some reason, like, it makes me, I live that joke pretty much every time I say it. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I mean, I think I, I, I the reason I ask is just because, you know, you've been doing it for so long. I've, mm -hmm. I've, you know, I've been doing it 
11 years and that's all i've been doing it for (laughs) (laughs) and so you know i just i i always want to know i I always want to learn from people Mm -hmm. who've been doing it for so long where they felt either slumps or, or 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 pitfalls or 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 feelings of like man this feels this feels different because you know in those first few years where you're starting everything mm-hmm. is so exciting everything right. is just so like even a bomb is like fine because it's just like you know all right you know like i i'm still doing this and this is still mm-hmm. exciting and i think i was talking about this with another comic recently where it, it the, like the switch on to to being like oh this can be a joke or this can or 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 i'm thinking about this as a comedian when you first start you're you're just learning to use that tool you're just learning to use that that switch where you're just like oh i oh i could i could apply this here and then you go back to your default state of being a human being mm-hmm. but i think when we've done this as long as we have that the, they switch they invert where the mm-hmm. default setting it becomes how you're always thinking as a comic and then you being a human being is the thing that you rarely visit mm-hmm. and have to try and like switch that on right and that's so challenging i mean have, i mean at least i mean at least for me and at least this for this comic that i was that i was chatting with mm-hmm. have you ever in in your time felt like you were in a in a in a slump or felt like you were in like man like comedy's not for me or or uh, have you always remained, you know, even keeled, positive, um, and always known that you were going to get out of it? I've, I've experienced all of that. Yeah. And even when the times when I was like, all right, I'm not going to do this anymore, I didn't feel bad about it. It was just like, all right, this, uh, it, uh, at least I was writing, so I was more interested in like writing on shows mm-hmm. at that time mm-hmm. until I was like, nah, I like to do both just as much, and let's try to do both as much as possible and let one help the other and leverage one against the other to get Mm -hmm. the most out of each Mm -hmm. so but there was a time when I was like like I I knew a friend that was getting in like four or five sets a night and I was like I don't want to do that Mm -hmm. and then I was like let me just do one a night and love that Mm -hmm. and then once I started loving that then I started trying to get more and started loving it back as much again. So it's just, it's just like a relationship with a person. You mm-hmm. know, you could like fall out of love for a minute, mm-hmm. but you know, hopefully you'll get back in love with them as I got back in love with comedy. Interesting. Yeah. So you just, you had to check back in with yourself and be like, this is going to be something that's going to work for me for now. And then I'll, and then I'll, I'll move forward from there. I just, you know, just had other interest, mm-hmm. you know, like one, one time I was going to took a directing class and I wanted to like make shorts and films and stuff like that. So I was distracted by that. Mm-hmm. And then and I wanted to like write on shows more mm-hmm. and have health insurance. <laughs> you know what I mean? And be able to buy some shit. Yeah. You know, because I wasn't getting that much road work. Mm-hmm. So I was doing that. And then for some somehow I just got back in. Yeah. With the full love of like stand up again. Yeah. What brings you the most joy creatively? Uh, writing, stand up, directing, uh, TV shows? Probably just like there's nothing better than like having a new joke idea, trying it, and it killing. Yeah. Beats sex. Mm-hmm. It, it beats an orgy. Mm-hmm. It just... <laughs> <laughs> it, it beats... It, 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 I feel like it. it's euphoric. It's like taking Molly, mm-hmm. you know, or something like that feeling like that joke worked. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you get to think about it all night. Yeah. And then you can't wait to do stand-up again to try it again and then to add some shit to it like like the the fact that that exists for us to feel that Mm -hmm. like and there's no especially when you're doing mics and there's you're not getting paid for it 
mm-hmm. but the fact that you could get a feeling that people pay for yeah and get that feeling yourself mm-hmm. is to me like a gift do you ever remember a time in your career where you bet on yourself and it backfired like where you you took a risk and it didn't work out no nah, only when i didn't bet on myself has shit backfired interesting do you have an example uh like yeah so even with soccer right mm-hmm. soccer is why i never really quit comedy because when i kind of gave up on it yeah those dudes were nice you know and they were better than me and they had failed at something that i hadn't even tried but i feel like if i had like use them to make me better at the game mm-hmm. and not like if they didn't make it i ain't gonna make it mm-hmm. then i would have like still got somewhere mm-hmm. you know because at at that time there was no league in America and then there eventually became a league in America and if I'd have like kept on playing I feel like I could have made like it it, in the the beginning of the league in America Mm -hmm. so then that's when I didn't back myself you know what I'm saying I see so but at that moment of realizing years later that I didn't back myself made me say I'm never quitting anything that I like ever again interesting because it was too late Mm -hmm. to go back Mm -hmm. and try to be a soccer player so I don't want it to be too late for me to do anything that I really want to do so that's why I'm like fully committed cut to tomorrow quick (laughs) (laughs) I'm out I know what I said Drew don't post the podcast I quit (laughs) what about um What about relationships? Are you, have you ever like met someone where you thought they were the person and they were okay with what you do and what you don't? It's a fickle thing. What we, what we Mm -hmm. have and having to be with somebody who's okay with that. Are you having trouble with your wife? Yeah. That's what I was asking. (laughs) No, I just mean like, have you, um, you know, or are are you in a relationship right now? Mm -mm. No. And do you ever, I mean, were you ever in a long relationship? Yeah, 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 yeah. Did that person get it? Did they not? Yeah, they got it. But, you know, there's other things that will make, like, a relationship not work. Sure. You know what I mean? So, it, it's, you know, it's f- fine. It's going to be, you, you, there's a challenge of finding someone who gets it, but then there's still the other things that might not make a relationship work. But... I I do think it is probably challenging for like a comic to like meet someone who gets it. Yeah. Like I've seen comics take their partner to the shows in the beginning of their relationship just to kind of like train them Mm -hmm. and give them an idea of like, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is what I'm doing. This is how it works. So that if you're home and I'm out, you know what I'm doing. What this is a peace like. of mind. Yeah. And I, if I come home late, it's because after we did the show and after I waited two hours to get on, I went with some friends to go eat mm-hmm. and laugh mm-hmm. and to get over the bad set. Yeah. I'm not out doing something that I ain't supposed to be doing. Yeah. It's just like you, you have to like kind of like because the concept of comedy is hard for us as comics to grasp. We don't even know what it is until we're doing it mm-hmm. and living through it. So mm-hmm. for somebody who's not even into it, yeah, for them to understand it, you almost have to bring them with you yeah, to give them a view of exactly what's going on. That's why so many comics date each other. Yeah, yeah. It's just so much You don't much have easier. to break, break them in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have, you ever, have you ever dated a, a comic before? Yeah, yeah. I dated, a, I dated a comic once before and it was fine, but it was, it, it, I mean... I, it would be, I think, so I, difficult. I have so many friends who are in mm-hmm. relationships where their partner is a comic, and it's just, it's got to be so hard to just, you're not competing, but at the same time, mm-hmm. you, there's there's things that happen that are like, uh, where you're wondering why not why not me or why not <laughs> why not that opportunity for me. That's funny, right? Because if you're dating someone, and their joke 
that they post like kills mm-hmm. and you posted a better joke that didn't kill you know you're like oh, <laughs> that joke? <laughs> get all those likes <laughs> like, hey, I mean she's got jokes but that ain't even one of the best ones like, and I'm, I gotta be like hey that's a great joke <laughs> Yeah, I gotta support. I gotta support. <laughs> this is her worst joke. I ain't gonna support her worst joke. This is this is a lie to me. <laughs> this this will destroy me as a as my moral <laughs> comedy fiber. <laughs> uh, so true. I um, yeah. I I I always wonder about um, I always wonder about people who are like you know even like Tom Scora and Christina. It's mm-hmm. just like. It, it, that's it's magical just, it's right? wild yeah yeah it's wild both both, both very funny individuals but mm-hmm. just both like at the top of their of their game and of this game mm-hmm. you know it's just crazy yeah that's magical that that's working and you see them on the podcast yeah like even if i loved someone and i they were a comic i was like would i want to like do a podcast with them and the yeah. fact that theirs works together yeah i'm like like what type of like I don't even know what the word is that is that work like how is that working you know what I mean because I'd like to separate things at yeah. some point but it's but it's it's fantastic man. yeah yeah it's a there there it shows that everything is possible yeah that's true I mean and, but their connection is like uh, their their rapport is just intrinsic so it's just it makes it makes so much sense for them yeah and I like how she's not judging of his thoughts and vice versa and i think maybe i've never found someone that i felt wasn't judging my thoughts or even if they weren't i might have felt it yeah or so it's like i I don't think i've found someone that i feel like i can just say whatever i want to say yeah and it wouldn't ruin the relationship and i and i think that's where they're at and it's a it's a goal Mm -hmm. relationship for most people to be able to say whatever you would say to your boys Mm -hmm. in front of your partner and then it not like affect anything affect anything can we have a talk yeah after yeah Yeah, yeah, Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. there's no talk after (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah, it all just happens there and they're just okay with whatever there's no ego involved in something like that yeah and that's what i don't trust I, i i've never experienced that so then that's why i'm like blown away by their relationship do you um have any uh do you have a routine that you stick to every day that um, kind of gets you through any of the of the of the bad times or anything that you do that like uh, you know just like fire? I mean, we have such an unorthodox like schedule. It's like I mean, it's hard to even keep a routine during the daytime when you're out so late. But is there something that you do that keeps you on track? Yeah, and now I'm I'm doing better at staying on track. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how I got anywhere before. Mm -hmm. But since the pandemic, two weeks before the pandemic, right, I got home two in the morning from a spot at the store. I was hanging out there after the show. I got in, it was 2 a.m. I was like, man, I'm going to watch like three hours of TV, go to bed at 5 a.m. This is the life. And then the pandemic happened. And then I was like, because there were no rules or no laws, I guess I just gorged myself on wasting time Mm -hmm. so that when the pandemic ended, I was like, I don't want to waste any more time. Mm -hmm. I wasted a whole pandemic and people improved themselves during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So now I was like, I'm going to use the time after the pandemic to improve myself. So now I try to go to bed at 12. Maybe I'll push it to one. I need six hours of sleep so I can get up at seven or six a.m. And then I can like meditate in the morning and stuff Mm -hmm. and then hit the coffee shop early, edit videos or make a video or start like writing a script Mm -hmm. or start working on jokes or any work I got to do. I just kind of knock it out early. So Mm -hmm. like today I was at the coffee shop already. Mm -hmm. I might go back after this, but I got a decent amount of shit done. So yeah. Now I can just run errands. Yeah. Do your podcast, run errands, or go back to the coffee shop. Yeah. And then it's just a more productive time now. Is that where you find most of your uh, writing is done? Is it as at the coffee shop? 
Yeah, but like I said, I, I'll write different places. So like on my way to shows, I'm listening to my set. Mm-hmm. You know, if I if I'm on the road, I listen to the to the last time I did the hour, and like work on it before I do it that weekend. Yeah, and then you know, so yeah, but but it's in a different way than just like sitting at the coffee shop. You know? Um. Well, I uh, I um. Love how much that you I love how much you write. I love watching you work on stage. Thanks, and man. Um, same, same, same to you. Like you're killing it, bro. Um, thank you. And I, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I love having people on where I just get to ask them, you know, about their about their journey and the things that they did to try and get to where they are. Mm-hmm. And so many people are so different. So mm-hmm. that's that's something that I really love and and, and appreciate. Um, and now you have a you have a podcast that you that you do, and it's a it's a soccer related podcast. Yeah, I'm dressed like I'm on my <laughs> yeah, podcast. I know, I know, I, I dress for I dress <laughs> yeah, for, for, you. for you as well. Um, mm-hmm. What's a, and your podcast is called a Soccer Comic Rant. <laughs> yeah, we try to be funny, but we be talking some serious <laughs> soccer <laughs> shit about the Premier League and European <laughs> soccer. Yeah, yeah, and shit's getting crazy with that. So mm-hmm. um, check out uh, Ian Edwards everywhere on social media, and um, you're on the road as well. Yeah, I got some dates. I got to get more, but I, I got a few. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, uh, well, great. Well, I'm, I appreciate you coming on, and uh, always, uh, always good to see you. Thanks, brother. Appreciate yeah. you, and you're a real motherfucking comic, man. <laughs> Thank Keep you. Keep doing your thing. <laughs> Thank you, man. <laughs> Have you ever had a dream that you um you had to do so much you could do anything?